Hello everyone, this is uh, Clean Energy Solutions, Clean Energy New Hampshire and Local Energy Solutions webinar series on heat pumps. Um, I'd like to welcome Dana Fisher and Mark Toussaint, our panelists. Um, we're going to wait a minute, see if there are more attendees coming in. I'd like to move forward and talk about how you can ask questions in this webinar. In the field on your right, there's a questions box. Please feel free to enter questions into there that will be answered at the end of each of our panelist discussions. Um, you can see the information here. You can also vi visit our website for more information and a recording of this webinar if you'd like to go back and see anything or previous uh, webinars. Today we'll be hearing from Dana Fisher of Mitsubishi and Mark Toussaint of Eversource. They will be giving us an overview of how heat pumps work and how utilities are working to drive the adoption of these devices across New Hampshire. The, this webinar is part of the LES webinar series. For more webinars such as this, please visit our site on the New Hampshire Local Energy Solutions webpage and please sign up for our emails if you're interested in more information and webinars like this. The Local Energy Solutions work group is an affiliate is an initiative of Clean Energy New Hampshire, the state's leading clean energy advocate and educator. Please consider becoming a member of Clean Energy New Hampshire. Uh, we are dedicated to lowering energy costs of New Hampshire citizens by advocating for change in the way that energy is generated, stored, and used by using fact-based information to communicate the benefits of growing the state's clean energy economy. We provide unbiased information on energy efficiency clean energy generation and policy options to empower individuals with knowledge and strengthen their local decision-making on where we get energy and how we use it. As a member, you get access to regular e-newsletters, members-only policy alerts, discounts on our events, and recognition in our annual report as a supporting member. Please visit cleanenergynewhampshire.org for more info. Now that the introductions are out of the way, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Dana Fisher. Uh, thank you so much, Josh, uh, and uh, thank you, Brianna. Uh, you know, uh, great, great to be on today. Um, I am Dana Fisher. I have been with Mitsubishi Electric uh, for the past three and a half years in the capacity as uh, area uh, sales manager for Maine and New Hampshire, um, which basically means that I travel around and visit with all of the distributor branches and uh, installers, and of course, over COVID, provide an awful lot of Zoom-based uh, training. Uh, to contractors about all the products that are available as well as uh, proper application and use of them. And so this slide deck that, that we have today to pour through over the next half hour is going to start out as Heat Pumps 101, but I really want you to know that we're going we're gonna to cover a wide range of topics on, on uh, how heat pumps work and sort of the, the top level of best practices. Um, there's lots of little rabbit holes that we can dive into and uh, really get into the weeds on the specifics of heat pumps. If you have a lot of questions or specific questions about a home or an application, you should feel free to type that into the chat box. And we're going to try and make sure there's plenty of time available at the end to just ramp through any of the particular questions. So um, uh, stick with me. We're going to we're going to cover uh, cover a good amount of ground. So, uh, Josh, if you want to slide, get to the first slide, we'll. Uh, I'll, I'll just start rolling. Okay, so <clears throat> what are we talking about with heat pumps? Well, um, you know, traditionally heat pumps <clears throat> were something that really, uh, you know, down south, they, they would use primarily for heating and cooling applications. And it's really uh, only in the last decade or so that heat pumps have shown up in uh, New Hampshire uh, for use for heating applications. And, and part of this really has to do with the changes in the technology over the course of the last decade or two that enables these units to use a refrigeration cycle, but be able to extract heat from outdoor air even when it's extremely cold outside, even when it's below negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit, negative 13 degrees Fahrenheit. These systems can operate efficiently and remove heat from outdoor air and fling it into your house. And the, the pieces of equipment that are used to accomplish this, um, you know, a mini split system, it's really kind of, it is a split system. In fact, that's really sort of part of the definition of it. So there's an outdoor unit 
and there's an indoor unit in all of these circumstances. In a one-to-one -one circumstance, it would be one unit outside and one unit inside, but the systems can certainly be configured so that you would have, um, you know, you could select a multi-zone system that would have multiple indoor units connected to one outdoor unit. And so I, I, I'll pause briefly to say that, you know, all my slides, my pictures are Mitsubishi slides. And of course, that's because I work for Mitsubishi. But a lot of the principles and product types that we're going to talk about in the next uh, few minutes, um, you know, are available through other manufacturers. And the principles that we're going to talk about for mini split heat pumps in the course of, of these products are consistent with exactly how the systems operate for other manufacturers. Now, there may be different specifications across the different manufacturers or different capabilities or functions, but they all basically operate on the same principles um, and, and can provide uh, heat uh, to cold temperatures if they're rated to do so. So the outdoor units um, you'll see depicted on the left-hand side, there are you know, all different sizes of units from very small units that have a single fan and you know, they, they all have a big radiator coil in them and a compressor. And then uh, you know, they get to very large units that might be like this, uh, the unit depicted with the purple box that's a, a double fan unit. Um, for Mitsubishi, anytime you see one of those double fan units with a multi-zone system, it means it goes to a branch box, you know, before it branches off to all and any of the indoor units. Although we do have one-to-one -one systems that put out so much heat and have such a strong uh, comp compressor in unit that uh, they are a double fan unit that just goes to one air handler or one um, uh, large ceiling cassette. The indoor units come in a whole bunch of different kinds of styles. Uh, everything from what is the most common, uh, commonly used indoor unit, the wall mount cassette that you see um, at the top. Um, you know, that, that's sort of the bread and butter of the industry. Um, it's, it has a coil and a blower wheel fan inside of it. Um, and then, uh, but there are also different versions that are, are also ductless, meaning no ducts, um, but come in different formats, like a ceiling cassette. Um, the ceiling cassette pictured in the middle in blue um, is a one-way ceiling cassette. It fits in between 16 on center joists in the conventional home, although the traditional ceiling cassette was uh, the cabinets 24 by 24 and would be totally uh, you know, suited for an office environment with a drop-down ceiling and two by two tiles. Um, there are floor mount models uh, that are actually really kind of low wall mounted um, that can distribute uh, air quite evenly throughout an entire space. All of these units really move enough air that it doesn't matter whether they're high or low for providing uh, cooling or heating. They 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 all operate extremely efficiently. Um, you know, I mean, there there are some things you want to take into consideration in terms of how far they'll throw the air across the room or how much of a room they'll they'll um, um, influence with their heating and cooling, but that really is something that the, the installer can help you identify um, and work through the load of the house to figure and identify what size equipment is required in order to meet the heating and cooling needs of the, of the unit throughout the entire season. There are also ducted units. Uh, so one of the three different styles of indoor units is depicted here. It's a full air handler. And frankly, this unit can do everything that a conventional furnace can do. Um, you could replace a conventional furnace with this and the existing ductwork, if it worked for the old furnace, will work perfectly fine for the air handlers that are available for heat pumps. Here again, it can be connected one to one. Uh, to a single outdoor unit, and some of those are very large. So you, you could, uh, you know, a house that would normally use eight, even 900 gallons of oil using an oil-fired furnace, um, you know, or, you know, more than a thousand therms of natural gas could be displaced entirely with our largest uh, air handler. Um, and they come in a hyperheat variety that uh, provides uh, heating capacity um, and operation all the way down to negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit um, ambient, you know, not even considering wind chill. Um, so next slide, Josh. Um, so like here, here's a, an image of uh, an example of the uh, ceiling cassette, the one-way ceiling cassette. You can see that it kind of disappears into the motif. Um, I've seen plenty of uh, new construction homes across New England that incorporate these throughout. 
Um, sometimes they're used in retrofit, but of course you'd probably have to cut open the bay of the, um, you know, the sheetrock going to the exterior wall to run your line sets. We'll get into uh, the, the connections in a second. Go ahead, next. And another, uh, you know, sort of uh, example with a with a low wall mount unit, um, they can be recessed into the wall a little bit so they don't stick out quite as much, um, or even set inside of a cabinet uh, with a special accessory kit. But um, they come in a variety of sizes, from 9,000 BTUs of cooling capacity to 18,000 BTUs of heating capacity. Um, next slide, please. So uh, just to kind of get to how they work, this is the first sort of uh, step into um, the components of the system. You'll see that the indoor unit is positioned high up on the wall uh, and the outdoor unit is, is outside. And, and of course, in New England, uh, we really want to mount these units up off of the ground high enough where they're not going to stay, where they're not going to uh, be drifted in with snow and that any condensate from the outdoor unit when it goes into a defrost cycle drips down onto the ground and uh, can form ice without any risk of growing up into the unit. And so in Maine, uh, the rebate criteria requires that the units are mounted 18 inches off of the ground. And frankly, I, I would make that a general statement that across New England, everybody should be putting these up, the outdoor units up off high enough off the ground on either a bracket or a stand so that they're clear of snow. And consumers should generally, uh, you know, be told by the installer that when they go out to shovel their steps, it's a good idea to just peek around the corner and, and shovel out underneath the heat pump too to keep it free and clear of snow. Um, air flowing through it is the source of heat, even when it's very cold. Now you'll notice that there are two lines in this um, image, uh, one red and one blue, depicting the flow of heat energy to and from the indoor and outdoor units. And uh, those are copper line sets, so small coppers. Often, oftentimes, uh, one line is 3 8 inches and the other one is quarter inch and they're insulated. And along the same uh, route with those copper lines goes uh, a set of wires um, to provide power from the outdoor unit to the indoor unit and also to uh, communicate between the two so that the indoor unit can ramp up and down its fan uh, to match um, the, uh, the, the output of the compressor um, and to coordinate their operations based on the algorithms that are programmed into the system. Um, now, you'll see that like, hey, it's wintertime in this scene and it's pouring out this cold air. What's going on? Well, these units can extract heat from outdoor air and so when the air goes flowing through the back of the unit and through the fan and out through the front, the air, whatever, it doesn't matter what temperature it is outside, the air coming out of the fan will be colder than outdoor air temperatures because it's extracting heat energy from that air and um, putting it into the refrigerant line and circulating it to the indoor unit and then blowing out uh, warm air into the house to heat up uh, the sofa and the sheetrock and your cat. Next slide, please. Now, uh, you know, I know that when I was in high school and any any time the topic of refrigeration cycles came up, that was my cue to fall asleep. Um, so I kind of made up my my own little chart here to describe how the refrigeration cycle works for these mini splits. So you can kind of see the profile of an outdoor unit on the left-hand side and the indoor unit on the right-hand side. And if we start at uh, where the or, uh, yellow arrow is, we have room, temper room temperature refrigerant under high pressure around 400 PSI, um, you know, in that ballpark, traveling to the expansion valve, uh, which is the triangle um, on the, on the left-hand side top. Now, um, the, the uh, refrigerant that's in these systems is, uh, is called 410A, and it's possible that it'll be phased out in, in, in uh, uh, a few years for a different refrigerant that will have a different uh, global warming potential. Um, but uh, it, it, they have very much, even, even the, the substitutes that may be coming down the road will have very similar physical properties. And the, the most important physical property um, that that we're going to talk about right here is, <laughs> as I mentioned, quickly going from uh, how heat pumps work 101 to uh, maybe 352 is uh, that the, um, the, the refrigerant has a boiling point of negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So when it goes through that expansion valve and it goes into a lower 
pressure state, around 100 psi in the outdoor coil, it dives for its boiling point. It is, it's attempting to get towards negative 30 or negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit, at which point it is certainly colder than anything that's going on outside. And so any of the heat energy that's in the air can get absorbed through the coil and into the compressor. Now, you might think, what the heck is he talking about all the heat energy out there when it's zero degrees or negative 10 degrees outside? Well, it turns out that the absence of heat energy is outer space, negative you know, 273 degrees centigrade. When it's zero or even negative 10 or negative 15 degrees outside, there is not nearly as much heat energy as there is when it's 70 degrees outside, but there's still quite a lot. And that that uh, that gas can absorb that heat energy. And then when it goes into the compressor, it reduces the volume of the gas and compresses that heat energy into a smaller space. And the manifestation of heat energy in a tighter ball is a higher temperature. And so when the refrigerant comes out of the compressor, it now has that compressed heat energy it's at 120 or even 130 degrees Fahrenheit. So then it travels along from the outdoor unit, from the compressor into the indoor unit where it gets to the indoor coil. The indoor coil is heated up to 120 degrees or thereabouts. And the indoor fan draws air from the out indoor temperature, 65, 68, 70 degrees, and goes through the hotter coil and picks off all that heat energy and flings it across the room to heat your sofa and sheetrock and your cat and the cycle continues that that the return the, the refrigerant returns back to the outdoor unit and the cycle continues again and again and extracts heat energy almost as though you're taking a sponge damp sponge and picking up heat energy in the form of water on the countertop and then squirting it into your living room you know with a, with a tight fist and then going back out and grabbing more heat energy outside. And so no refrigerant is lost in the course of that cycle. And the only energy that goes into making this all happen is the electrical energy that goes into the motors and the electronics that run the compressor and the two fans, one fan outside and one fan inside. And so on a seasonal basis, for every one unit of, a, of electric energy that goes into running those pumps and motors, the system can extract three units of heat energy from outside and bring it inside. And this is what makes heat pumps so powerfully cheap to heat. Um, and it really, you know, so it depends on the price of electricity as to what the cost of operating the system will be. But even at what's typical for most of New Hampshire, around 16 cents a kilowatt hour, on a seasonal basis, it translates into something akin to a dollar fifty or a dollar sixty a gallon number two heating oil. So it's very, very uh, inexpensive. Now it's less expensive to operate heat pumps when it's warmer outside than when it's colder outside. But at the cost of sixteen cents per kilowatt hour, it is always cheaper to run a heat pump than to use propane, no matter how you're burning it, and it's it's typically cheaper to use a heat pump than to burn number two heating oil until you get down to about zero degrees where you hit the balance point. But even at that point at negative five degrees or negative 10 degrees, you're saving pennies. And so over the course of the entire season, the difference between using a heat pump above and below zero degrees versus your conventional heating system might amount to a grand total of five bucks. So generally speaking, the recommendation is to leverage your heat pump to the maximum extent possible that you can throughout the entire season. And know that if you size and select equipment that's large enough to accommodate your design load for your house, you can displace 100% of your heating load without any uh, augmenting backup heat source. If you choose not to install all the uh, heat pump equipment that would be required to meet your peak load at super cold temperatures, that's fine. Use your heat pump to the maximum extent you can. Keep it running all the way through all those extremely cold weather events and supplement as you need to, whether that's with a wood stove or any other heat source for that matter, for those brief periods of time when the heat pump that you've selected might not be able to keep up with a full load if you haven't selected enough heat pumps to do that. Next slide. The cooling season is the exact opposite. So there's a four-way valve inside of the outdoor unit. And when you push the mode button and select cooling on the heat pump, 
it switches that four-way valve and reverses the flow so that it extracts heat energy from your indoor air. So your indoor air at 70 degrees will flow in past a coil that's cooled to something like 40 degrees Fahrenheit and extract the heat energy, pouring colder air out into the room and taking that warmer refrigerant, now you know 70 or 80 degrees, depending on you know what your room temperature is, out to the compressor where the compressor compresses that gas into a higher density and really, really hot and then blows that heat energy out into your backyard and across your bushes. And then it goes into the expansion valve. And when it goes through the expansion valve to a low pressure state, it goes down to you know, around 40 degrees Fahrenheit and cools that indoor coil and provides that really pleasant, uh, really pleasant breeze. And of course, when you have a cold surface like you find in the coils, uh, condensate from the humidity in the air uh forms on the coils and drips down into the condensate pan and and uh, gets diverted outside and extracts humidity from the room with making the room more comfortable part of being comfortable in the summer is having the right temperature but a big part of of being comfortable is having the right humidity level next slide So I'm going to I I have I still have a bunch more slides, but we're uh, quickly coming up on on the uh, you know uh, the transition for uh, the next speaker. So I'm going to move through a bunch of slides relatively quickly, um, but I I really want to just point out like this is a snapshot of of our dear planet um, you know from about a little over a year ago, and you'll notice in purple that's the polar vortex, and so sometimes that does swirl down and uh, you know this year it hit Texas and a couple of years ago it it hit Indiana and the Midwest, and it was back in 2017, 2018 when it came through um, Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont, and we really experienced some of the coldest temperatures in memory. And, I, and of course, I was working for Mitsubishi at that time and visiting all the distributors and installers, and during that period of, of super extreme cold, the coldest uh, period of time in, mem in recent memory, um, you know, everybody was in the HVAC industry was very busy uh, dealing with customers who had no heat calls, um, almost entirely for conventional heating systems um, that hadn't been maintained or, you know, just were really working really hard and having a hard time keeping up. But even during that period of extreme cold, I was not getting any phone calls from anybody complaining that their Mitsubishi equipment was not working. And in Northern Maine, where you know it's it's super cold, at least as cold as uh, Berlin, New Hampshire. There are thousands upon thousands of heat pumps installed, and they continue to be extremely popular and used for heating. Um, and so, for any any folks that are listening that are concerned that these heat pumps will not operate at super cold temperatures, they should know that uh, there are people in northern Maine that heat their homes entirely with heat pumps. Next slide. One of the other uh, cold areas uh, that has employed a lot of heat pumps is Norway. They got a bit of a jump start on New England, maybe installing, starting to install heat pumps uh, more than a decade before we did. And Norway, which has about four times the population um, and number of households as uh, New Hampshire, um, they installed a million heat pumps in the course of a 12 year period from 20, uh, 2003 to 2015. And so if you were to divide that by four to, to make it equivalent to New Hampshire, that's the equivalent of a quarter million heat pumps being installed in New Hampshire in that same period of time. Now, heat pumps have been happening, installs have been happening very, very quickly in New Hampshire. Next slide. And have been falling along this blue trend line and New Hampshire is probably somewhere in the ballpark of where the green diamond is. Um, some states like Maine and Vermont might be a little bit more ahead of that uh, on the trend with the gold uh, uh, diamond, but the same trend line. And the, the highly accelerated lines in orange and red are representative of the kind of policy goals that are in place in Maine and red and in New York state for, um, uh, for the gold line. In New York State is uh, has a goal of installing 500,000 heat pumps per year within the next six years, and Efficiency Maine has a goal of uh, having more than 100,000 new installations of heat pumps within the next four years, and frankly, they're on track to do that, and New Hampshire isn't that far behind, um, and, uh, you know, we're seeing just explosive growth um, in the in the ballpark of 20% or so per year, year over year, the last few years in New Hampshire. 
um, just, uh, just a really hotbed market, and uh, a lot of people are making that choice. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, there are many, many units installed in northern Maine um, that work very, very well and continues to be elevated demand. Next slide. And uh, they can be, you know, there are plenty of examples of homes that use heat pumps entirely on their own. In fact, uh, just over the border uh, uh, near White River Junction is a company called Vermod that makes modular homes, high performance modular homes, dense packed, really, really tight homes for those of you that haven't bumped into them. And they're heated entirely by um, Mitsubishi heat pumps uh, and rather small ones at that. Uh, that are tied into their, uh, you know, their ductwork as part of their new structure that also uses a, um, uh, an energy ventilation system uh, to incorporate into them. And that makes it, you know, one of the things that's a big push across New England is this concept of strategic electrification, um, you know, in converting all of our heating systems uh, and transportation over to electricity. And um, heat pumps are a big, big part of that. Next slide. There are also examples of, uh, you know, commercial structures. Um, here's the Hollis Primary School, Hollis, New Hampshire, um, and uh, consultants right in uh, Concord area. Our, our good friend uh, Dick Henry, um, he, uh, he, you know, um, he was a consultant on this project, and uh, they spray foam the entire exterior of this 1960s era uh, block and brick uh, elementary school. That was having a lot of uh, heat differential between, you know, the north side of the building was really cold all winter, and the south side of the building had big glass windows that would heat it up. And so the kids would, on one part of the building, would be in winter coats, and the other side would be in t-shirts. Um, and you know, when when it was time for uh, go to the cafeteria, you know, you either had kids putting on coats or taking them off. It was kind of crazy. Um, but with the uh, with the change in the insulation level on the exterior, the structure, and putting all that thermal mass inside and also adding heat pumps to all the classrooms or the vast majority of the classrooms, they've been able to dramatically improve the, living, the, the learning conditions and significantly lower uh, the, uh, the operational costs of the school, which has just been great for the tax base. Next slide. slide. There's a wide range of different products. And here again, this is, this is applicable to all the different manufacturers, um, but there are, there are full air handlers and slim duct air handlers. There's a variety of controls and Wi-Fi interfaces that can be used on your phone to monitor and control temperatures uh, from across the web, anywhere that you are. Um, there are uh, different colored indoor units, silver, black, white, uh, depending on your designer needs. Um, and they come in a great wide range of sizes for single zones as well as multis. Next slide. Um, here's, an app, here's another application with the one-way ceiling cassette that's tucked in. Next slide. Um, air handlers can be positioned either horizontally or vertically. So sometimes you'll see them in basements and sometimes you'll see them in attics where they're incorporated into the thermal uh, envelope of the home. Um, and, you know, ducted solution might make a lot of sense where you already have pre-existing ductwork or you have like three small bedrooms that are all that really doesn't warrant having an individual ducted unit or ductless unit in each one of the spaces. So you could you can hit all three rooms with one uh, rather small ducted unit. Next slide. Um, and here's an example of, of, you know, a different kind of ducted unit that might fit in a different sort of space. Um, very popular in new construction, especially high performance. Next slide. Um, and any of these different single zone systems, um, they, you know, wide range of sizes, but they can all be incorporated into multi zones. Next slide. So a uh, multi zone can, uh, you know, tie onto, you know, they, they'll be designated. So, you, you know, multi zone will be able to handle three or five or, you know, eight different indoor units, it'll all be specified when you purchase the unit. You can't really expand upon uh, the, the, the model number itself. Next slide. But you can either have all the same equipment or slightly different equipment, and there's you know a variation in the sizes of the indoor equipment that can be employed to match the capacity of the outdoor multi-zone system. Next slide. Um, and, you know, in addition to the controls that are available through the manufacturers, there are also third-party thermostat interfaces. So if you really wanted to have a Nest or an Ecobee, you can do that. Next slide. 
Um, and, you know, generally, and I'll just go through this very quickly, you know, workmanship is important. Just making sure everything is level is important. The first step on wall mount units is to find where the location is going to be and mount this metal bracket that the outdoor, that the indoor unit hangs on. Next step. Um, and, uh, you know, the, so wall mount units hang on that uh, back plate. There's a lower black uh, back plate for the, the low wall mount units. Next slide. And then uh, they are making a penetration in your house. Uh, the technicians need to run the electrical and um, uh, the uh, refrigerant lines from the outdoor unit to the indoor unit. So oftentimes it's more economical to have uh, the indoor units mounted on an exterior wall. You can certainly put it on an interior wall, but that often involves additional carpentry um, and carpentry isn't free. Um, but uh, any penetrations going in and out of the house should be well sealed against moisture, airflow, and any any sort of pests that might uh, come through the exterior. So um, probably uh, need to put some sort of a mastic or, or uh, aluminum coating that would uh, prevent anything from coming through in addition to spray foam uh, to maintain the insulation level in and around the tubing. Next slide. Um, of course, you you know, <clears throat> following code uh, is a, a, an important part of a quality installation. Um, selecting the right electrical equipment, having an electrician uh, perform uh, the appropriate duties um, throughout the entire process, pulling the correct permits. Next slide. There are different style stands. Um, oftentimes, early on uh, units would be mounted to the side of wood houses, but uh, there are occasions where that will cause some amount of vibration. It's, I have mine mounted to the side of my house. It's really not a big deal. It's certainly a lot quieter than some of the heating systems that I've had in the past, but uh, just to avoid that, uh, consumers and, and uh, some contractors will tend to use stands that sit aside from the house and rest on a, on a plastic pad that's supported by uh, gravel or P-stone. Next slide. Another alternative is to select a bracket that might lag to the concrete of a foundation. Next slide. But it's really important to have it up out of the snow um, and, and, and or if it's underneath a, a roof line or other uh, um, object that would uh, have the potential to have bulk moisture pour down on the unit that the unit is somehow protected with either a cap or uh, some sort of a roof. Next. Um, you know, clearly uh, having it high out of the snow is important. And you want to keep it in mind, you know, I mean, this one unit on the left-hand side is depicted underneath a window. You want to make sure that uh, you're not impacting egress uh, from a house. Next slide. Here's a, this is the last slide in this group, um, but uh, you can see what I want to point out on this one uh, is really that not only does it have a roof over the top to protect it from uh, rain and snow and icicles that would come down and elevate it up off of the ground so that, uh, you know, you don't have any ice buildup coming up or snow drifts coming up underneath it, but you'll notice that the lower units have a little cap on their roof to actually protect them from uh, the defrost that would pour down from the top unit when it goes into a defrost cycle. You know, during a snow squall or even freezing rain, the units will accumulate some amount of ice on the outdoor unit. And it goes into a short uh, defrost cycle to reverse the cycle of heat and just warm up the outdoor coil to melt it off, melt off any of the ice and snow. Uh, and that'll drip down underneath it. And in this case, uh, the top unit's defrost will drip into that onto that little um, uh, roof and pour away harmlessly to the side and it won't impact the lower unit. If you didn't have a cap of that nature, you'd have the lower unit going into defrost mode more frequently. And when the units go into defrost mode, which is normal, natural, and happens every single year on every single unit, um, they, they can't provide heat for that brief couple of minutes. Um, and then the, once they clear their, their coil, they go back into heating mode and then march along and make up the difference. So um, that's that's pretty much what I have for this uh, quick half hour. Um, I know Mark has got a lot of great details for us and I'm hoping that we can uh, have an opportunity to answer any questions or dive deep into any of the topic areas that uh, you, you have burning questions on. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, we're going to move along to Mark's presentation now and we'll answer all questions at the end of this presentation. I'd now like to introduce the next presenter, Mark Toussaint from Eversource.
Thank you, Josh, and thanks, Dana. That was a really good presentation, and thanks to all of you for being here today. My name is Mark Toussaint. I work with the commercial, industrial, and municipal programs at Eversource. I know some of you have, have worked with me in the past, and some of you will, will be new to the programs. I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, data went into the, the hows and whys of, of heat pumps, how they work, and where you might use them, and what you can accomplish with them. I'd like to talk today about how you can work with your utility and through the New Hampshire Saves Energy Efficiency Programs and access incentives, regardless of what type of customer you are. Next slide, please. So just briefly, what is New Hampshire Saves? We're a partnership of four electric and two gas utilities in New Hampshire. That's Eversource, Liberty Utilities, New Hampshire Electric Co-op, and Unito. And the programs offer energy efficiency opportunities for all types of customers. We have small and large commercial and municipal where I work. Uh, we have a number of residential programs. We have income qualified programs. And we actually cover about 98.5% of the people in New Hampshire. The remainder would be served by municipal uh, electric systems and they don't participate in the programs. Next slide. So why would the utilities uh, help you use less of the product that they sell? We get asked this question a lot. Uh, one is that it, the cost to save electricity in New Hampshire is far lower than the cost to buy electricity in New Hampshire. We're typically saving uh, at a rate of about two to four cents per kilowatt hour on the commercial programs. And we're and the cost to buy in New Hampshire, certainly in Eversource territory, is about 13 cents per kilowatt hour. And that doesn't uh, take into account any demand charges or anything like that that you might incur. So the other things is obviously it's great for the environment. That's very important to me. Great for uh, carbon redu reduction goals. It's good for the customer in terms of helping them to accomplish what they need to do in their business or in their home while using less energy. Next slide. So we're talking mostly about heat pumps today. Well, just wanted to let you know, we also offer incentives and assistance on lighting, uh, HVAC, compressed air, motors and drives. And then we do custom projects, which might be anything from a snow gun to building insulation, to uh, faucet aerators, to an injection molding machine. So we'll really look at anything in a commercial setting, anything that'll save electricity or natural gas. And in a municipal setting, we can actually expand that to those fuels plus oil and propane. So we'll look at anything that'll save energy cost effectively. Next slide. All right. So just to talk a little bit about how you can access these heat pump rebates for different programs. I'll start with the residential programs. And probably our most involved one is, is our Energy Star Homes. That's a whole building program where, where we do plan reviews, we do midpoint check-ins with you and with your builder. And what we do is we plan to incentivize the performance of the building beyond what you have to do to meet energy codes. So the national statistics say it costs about three to $5,000 more to build your home to Energy Star Homes standards, but we offer you up to $4,000 in rebates, and then you save 15 to 30% of the energy costs in your home for the whole life of the house, for as long as you own it, as long as anybody owns it. So you can enroll with this. The easiest way to do it is to talk to your builder and ask if they're an enrolled, uh, enrolled in the Energy Star Homes program. If they're not, uh, you or the builder can go to nhsaves.com and we can connect you with the appropriate staff people at your utility who can walk your builder through the process and what they would need to do to qualify your home through the program. Next slide. All right, so we also have an income qualified uh, program where if you meet certain income levels and you have a high energy burden relative to your income, you can qualify for a number of services, including uh, heating assistance or electricity assistance, and anyone eligible for those programs can participate in this weatherization program that we offer. It's another whole house program where our goal is to weatherize the house, use as little energy as possible, and then in certain situations, if, if the customer has electric heat, um, we can certainly cover the full cost of conversion over to heat pumps at that point. 
and there are situations where we can help um, if the heating system needs to be replaced anyway. Next slide, please. So to qualify for that program, you would work through your regional community community action agencies, and these agencies are are really a godsend to the people who need them. They run some of your Meals on Wheels programs, some of your rental assistance programs, some of your heating assistance and programs. And if and again, if you qualify based on income for any of that uh, heating assistance, you would be able to qualify for this uh, income qualified program that we have. Next up. Now for other homes, if you have an existing house and you'd like to improve the energy efficiency of your house, you can visit us at New Hampshire Saves and we have this, um, this calculator that produces what's called a home heating index. Very simple. All you do is you fill in the square footage of your home and then your two years worth of your, your average annual fuel usage. And so you'll see on this chart, the house that was put in um, is kind of on the higher end in terms of energy use intensity. And so this house would qualify for the program and we would send out an auditor to do an energy audit and they'd find out how leaky the home is, find out what it needs in terms of improvements to save energy, uh, save heating fuel primarily. And then we would offer, we would come up with a scope of work and the utilities would offer to pay for a portion of the energy improvements. And so we don't have direct heat pumps, heat pump incentives through that program, but we do have a very low interest financing program. If you do a whole house project, you can add a heat pump to that financing as you do your insulation as well. So it's pretty, it's a pretty easy way to get one. Next slide, please. Then we also have online rebates for heat pumps and for heat pump water heaters. Heat pump water heaters are very similar in, in concept to heat pump, except as you might have guessed, they heat your water instead of the air, often paired with a highly insulated tank. Uh, but we do $400 a ton for qualified heat pumps, and those need to be uh, highly efficient heat pumps that can that perform well in cold climates where we live. We also do $70 a ton for cooling only units or $750 per unit for heat pump water heaters. And you can get information on all of those and how to apply online at newhampshiresaves.com. You can also, I know from talking to a lot of the installers, uh, a lot of the installers in the state will help prep that application for you so you can minimize your paperwork in doing it. Next slide, please. So on the commercial side, we have a number of different programs as well. For existing buildings, we have our a traditional incentive program for HVAC that we've had for many years. Under that program, you would propose to us what you want to put in. You'd send us cut sheets for the unit that you're planning on putting in. We would review it and approve it, and we pay two to $300 per ton. Um, and when I say commercial buildings, what I mean is any non-residential. So we get a lot of questions about whether a church qualifies or a school or a nonprofit or something else that you might not traditionally think of as commercial, but anything that's not a residential property would, would qualify for these programs. Next up. So our new building uh, approach is very similar to what we do with homes. We take a whole building approach and we try to, we review plans, we do design charrettes, and we incentivize customers and builders for moving beyond what's required by code. And so we have a number of pathways to do that. Um, some are very involved, some are very simple, but the idea is you're going to be in this building for a very long time. We want you to select the most efficient equipment that you can find. And we understand that there is a cost to that, an additional cost. And we're here to help you pay for that additional cost so that it makes the decision to move to a highly efficient unit a lot easier. And so as heat pump incentives are rolled into a whole building incentive that might include um, all of your mechanicals, your lighting, your insulation, and the whole thing. And that might be a blended incentive that's offered between us and your gas utility, depending on where you're located. Next slide, please. So this is our newest program, our midstream incentives. 
And what we're trying to do here is if, if you know what you need and you've worked with a contractor and you're buying it from somebody local, and what I mean by that is anybody in New Hampshire, most of the distributors in Massachusetts, and there are a number of them in Vermont as well, anybody who sells into New Hampshire, uh, we've worked with them to set up a deal where they can apply the incentives directly to your sale price. So when your contractor goes and buys the unit on their account, the rebate is built into it, and then we catch up with the, with the distributor at the end of the month. And what that does is it gives you some certainty. It makes sure that you know what you're getting for an incentive. You don't have to wait for any paperwork. You don't have to do any extra work. And there's no waiting for the money either because it's applied at the front end of the project instead of the back end. So if you visit NewHampshireSaves.com, uh, you will find a list of distributors and you'll list, find a list of um, incentives and qualifying equipment. And that's true for HVAC, for lighting, and for food service equipment. Next up. So I've mentioned it a few times, this is our website, NewHampshireSaves.com. You'll see on the left, there's a group of programs for residential customers. And on the right, there's a group for businesses and towns. Some of you may fall into both. Uh, you can find the incentive information. You can also find stories of what other customers have accomplished with energy efficiency. You can connect to us to find uh, advice or technical assistance or just more information if you need it. And you can see the events that we're planning so that you might be able to go on and register if you want to and attend some of these some of these workshops and seminars. Next up. And that is all I have for today. I think that leaves us some room for some questions. And here's my contact information if you happen to need it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We're, we will now be taking questions. Here's our information for the webinar series. Uh, we're going to go through the questions on the right. Uh, Mark and Dana, can you see the questions or do you want me to go through them? I don't see them, sorry. Okay, let's start at the top. Dana, I'm going to unmute you. Okay. Great. So I think this will be a couple of these are more specific. We're going to go with the more broad ones. Um, we can get them all. Okay. Um, we have one about a maintenance garage with a 12 foot ceiling. Can it be serviced by a heat pump only without a backup if they want to maintain 60 degrees outside? with negative 25 outside okay so so uh here's uh there's there's you know there's a load there's load calculation software you know called manual j that can be used to determine what the load of a building is and get a good sense of it um and that's that's an important tool for you know proper sizing with an installer but generally speaking for every you know if, if it's an existing building it doesn't matter whether it's a garage or a home you know in New Hampshire, for every full tank of oil or equivalent that would be used, it pretty much translates into a peak load requirement of 20,000 BTUs. And so if you know roughly how much fuel is traditionally used in any given space, including a maintenance garage, you can uh, select the appropriate equipment to match that heating load. So if you were like, hey, you know, and, and that's, you know, it, it doesn't, there's, so a maintenance garage where it has a high ceiling, you know, you might end up having, you know, depending on the size and the insulation level with it and whether it's attached to other buildings, you may end up having multiple units or, you know, a, a larger single system in order to accomplish that. But absolutely, can you heat a space like that? Definitely. Okay, the next question is from Nancy. It's... Uh, my contractor said that a mini split was not good enough to install for their small uh, their small tight space. I'm not sure. We don't have any any more of the details on that. Um, is the EcoDan air to water heat exchanger available in the U.S.? Uh, so the Eco so the EcoDan is not yet available in the United States. Um, when when uh, that comment comes up about the EcoDan, that's referring to an air to water system. So 
right now pretty much all the systems that are popular in the United States are air to air, meaning it's extracting heat energy from the air and it's distributing it using airflow inside of the house. Um, Mitsubishi and other manufacturers um, make air to water products that basically circulate, you know, take outdoor heat energy and warm uh, water you know, or liquid in order to circulate in heat homes. And that's actually the most popular manner of heating for significant portions of uh, Central Europe. Um, and, uh, and, and so there's a lot of people that would like to have that come to the United States. Um, most of the time, when we talk about air to water systems, we're talking about lower temperature hydronics. So usually like 110 or 120 degrees circulation uh, throughout a home, which would be common for European style, uh, you know, heater panels or uh, radiant through floors. Um, baseboard heating really requires an elevated temperature, just the way that it's that it's made to accommodate a higher uh, airflow up and through it that really promotes circulation. So you have to have temperatures in definitely in excess of 150 degrees, if not more, in order to make that work. That would only happen with use of a refrigerant, um, you know, using CO2, carbon dioxide as a refrigerant, which is done in some places in the world. Um, and there may be possibilities of that coming to the US, but not in 2021. Okay, next question from Fred Portnoy is, they have a off-grid electric battery system and they want to know how much they have to build up their power system before considering a four season mini split. That's okay. Calculated BTUs given building envelope delta Ts and the wattage required. Yeah, so that that's, um, there, I'll, I'm gonna start this out by saying that, you know, of course 95%, if not 98% of all solar installations are grid tied. And so if you have a grid tied solar system that has net metering and is putting energy out onto the grid and you get a credit for it, that sort of thing, um, you know, heat pumps great because, you know, you use it, you, you know, you're generating the energy that's going into the system and any amount in excess of that, like even in the middle of the night is not a big deal because it's coming from the grid. When you have a off grid solar array, now you have to have sufficient battery storage capacity in order to get you through those periods of time when you don't have sun like at night or you know when you don't have sun for a couple of days which you know doesn't happen very often but november and december tend to be pretty cloudy um and so when when you're trying to size a system the solar array system that's grid tied for solar pretty much for every 100 gallons of oil that you're seeking to displace with heat pumps, you would install one kW of solar capacity and panels on, on the rooftop. So that's on an annualized basis, that's about how much energy, you know, the one kW of capacity, three panels on the rooftop would provide the equivalent amount of electricity required to displace 100 gallons of heating oil by putting that electricity into a heat pump. With a off-grid style system, you, you would, I, you're probably going to end up, I mean, it's fine. I've seen situations where people have used heat pumps, particularly for seasonal loads, but you're still going to want to have some other, um, some other fuel source unless you have an extraordinarily large array and battery setup. Um, just because the heat pumps, even a small one is going to draw, you know, uh, three to 500 watts all the time. And you know, off-grid arrays, um, you know, have to be pretty big to support, you know, something. You know, it really depends on the structure and the load and everything else. But I mean, like, if you had a house that would normally consume, I don't know, 600 gallons of heating oil, um, you would expect to have, you know, some period of time during the winter when you would have a couple thousand watts of instantaneous consumption for, you know, for days on end. Um, and that's gonna really, that's, you, you don't wanna get into a situation where you have to use a generator. So you, you, you know, unless you have an extraordinarily large system, you'd almost certainly have some supplemental heating situation with a, a grid tie system. I mean, with a, with a not, with a system that was off the grid, I'm sorry, with a system that's off the grid. Okay, great. Our next question comes from Bill Haley, who sent this question in before the, the webinar. And it's talking about the 
Mitsubishi Hyperheat Pump and an Emporia energy monitoring system, who they are, they're concerned about the um, phantom load and draw from their systems to heat coils to um, keep up efficiency. Okay, so um, so the, the the when when so there's there's different kinds of concerns about about heat pumps and the amount of electricity that they may or may not use at different different things. And it's true that like during um, you know in order to stay ready, heat pumps need to make sure that the oil in their compressors is not cold. And so that it can turn on and operate at a given time. And so heat pumps, when it's very cold outside, will continue to use 80, 120 watts of power uh, through the windings in their compressor in order to maintain the coil temp, the the, the compressor oil temperature. Um, so that's where we we're really getting to some super nitty gritty. Um, you know, we're talking about the equivalent of a couple dollars worth of electricity over the course of a month. Um, but uh, you know, for some folks that are monitoring that really closely, that's 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 something that they're going to look to, um, and uh, you're going to want to just understand that the, some of those phantom loads, which you're calling phantom loads, are functional loads that are required, um, and and part of the overall operation of the system. Thank you. I have a question about needing or not needing a backup heat source, which I think you already covered a little bit. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, that, well, so that, is that, 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 is, is that the you, whole question? Yeah. Okay. Well, so, um, you know, part of it, part of it depends on, on, um, you know, how, what, what your methodology or what, what the, what your, um, what your expectations are for, for the home. Okay. So, you know, some people have an expectation that uh, that every single room is going to be able to maintain 70 degrees Fahrenheit all through the entire winter, no matter what's going on. And so you can accomplish that, but it requires a fair amount of, of design in the equipment and placement and indoor units in order to completely match that expectation. Now, uh, and you could do it and have no need for additional backup thereafter. So absolutely, absolutely can be done. Um, but there are also plenty of people in New England who grew up with a wood stove and you're used to it being warmer in one part of the house than in all the rest. And as long as those other extreme parts of the house don't really get super cold, it's just not a big deal. And so it really come, kind of comes down to lifestyle and what your expectations are as to how you would place your heat pumps. It's really no different than deciding to have multiple wood stoves. I mean, you you might decide that you want to have wood stoves in every single room in the house, but it's um, you really, depending on your lifestyle and your expectations, it's really kind of not necessary. And so, um, you know, most of the time, um, you don't, you know, most people will find that they have very good uh, temperature distribution using multiple heat pumps, but not necessarily having an indoor unit in every single room. And if you really want to have uniform temperature throughout your entire spaces, then using a ducted system that's appropriately sized um, is great. And I, you know, whether you need supplemental or not um, really depends on, on matching the equipment. And frankly, you know, if the Europeans, like I mentioned in Norway, um, if you go and you read some of their guidance and the way that they design systems, they actually select heat pumps to match 80% of the heating load of their house, and then either decide to add additional heat pumps or something else uh, to manage the rest. And that that sort of makes sure that they don't oversize the system and they get a highest level of performance out of it and displace, because even though they're talking about 80% of the load, you actually end up displacing more than 90% of the total amount of fuel that you would use from a system that's slightly undersized. Um, so here again, like, you know, if if you want to have backup heat, there's no reason why you can't do that. It's just that you may find that you don't really need it. But whether you use it or not really depends on your expectations of how warm you want the house and and in the layout of your house and how much you want to spend on heat pump equipment. 
Okay. Uh, I've gotten a few questions about being able to uh, see the webinar later from people who have joined late. You can find the webinar record at www.nhenergy.org slash webinars. Uh, we'll be posting that up uh, within a couple days after this, and there are also our older webinars on there if you'd like to take a look at those. Our next question is whether it is more efficient to run a heat pump for cooling on drying mode or in air conditioner mode. They are uh -huh. getting higher temperatures when they set the thermostat for AC mode. Okay, so that's a great question. So um, on, on all these systems, when you put them in dry mode, really what you're doing is you're putting it into a low air conditioning mode with a low fan. And so it, it is air conditioning mode, it's just that you're not pushing a lot of air um, and it, you're really not controlling the temperature of the room so much as allowing the system to continue to run at that low level until such time as you uh, drop the temperature of the room more than you know five degrees Fahrenheit. Um, which will seem pretty chilly. And so I'm not sure if there's much of a difference in terms of your energy consumption one way or the other. You could certainly accomplish the exact same thing by just setting your set point at whatever is comfortable, um, you know, in air conditioning mode and just have your fan on low. But by having your fan on low, you're really giving the opportunity for condensation to form over a longer period of time, which enhances the amount of moisture that gets removed from the room, which is really the contributing factor to making sure that the room is comfortable is to be dry. So you're more likely to be comfortable if you extract more moisture out of the room using a low fan mode than if you use everything on super powerful and you just drop the temperature of the room as fast as you can and don't really remove air. Um, uh, remove moisture as much. That will lead to more of like a clammy feeling in the air if you super cool the room fast before removing the moisture. So whether you're in, it, it, just to close it out though, uh, whether you're in air conditioning mode or dry mode, you're basically doing the same thing. It's just a question of how the fan is set and whether it's going to meet a set point or whether it's going to just have a lower threshold at which point it'll, it'll turn off. Okay, the next question is is it possible for one outdoor compressor to run both a wall or ceiling mount air unit in the basement as well as a pre as preheating the water going into an existing oil boiler? Well, so that is uh, that that gets back to the air to water question. That's um that's actually um, a likely product that should arrive um, you know in in 2022 or 2023. Um, there's a couple of different products that Mitsubishi is looking to bring to the marketplace. I'm sure competitors will be doing the same. Um, but, uh, you know, there are products that basically, uh, you know, there's a, a water module that would, uh, you know, heat domestic hot water either as a preheat or as your primary domestic hot water heater. Um, and some of them, you know, tie into a multi-zone system and some of them are standalone one-to-one -one as a water heater. Um, it really depends on the configuration, and I, I'm I know like many people in New England, um, I'm really looking forward to those products coming here. They've been in use in in uh, in Europe for a long time, and it's just overdue for them to be in our market. Thank you. Um, a qu question from Edward: Can these pro these be purchased and installed by the homeowner? So you you know any homeowner can go onto Google and you can find a whole bunch of websites and different you know that that will sell the units and drop them off via FedEx or whatever and you'll see lots of ads for Mr. Cool and uh, boy isn't that slick and sounds awesome but I really I really want to discourage anybody that's listening to 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 go through that process and it's not because um, you know because of the relationship I have with contractors it's because there really are legit steps involved in setting up the system to ensure that it has a long life and that you don't lose refrigerant. And so, you know, like, like for example, when you run these line sets through your house, the copper line sets, it's imperative that they are completely free of even microscopic levels of moisture. And they accomplish this by pressure testing the system to 600 PSI after making you know, appropriate and well-practiced connections, and then purging the system with nitrogen and alternating nitrogen and vacuum 
to get a very low vacuum to boil off all of the microscopic levels of of moisture in the line sets and remove it. And that's critically important to ensure that there's no corrosion over time or uh, you know improper uh, uh, treatment of the of the compressor that would reduce the life cycle of the equipment. Um, you're also dealing with 220. Um, so it's not like plugging an appliance in the wall or something. Um, I know that a lot of people in New England are super skillful and crafty and do a lot of different things, um, plumbing or electrical or you name it. Um, but this is one category of, of installation that's really best left to people that have uh, the appropriate equipment to make sure that it's done correctly. And what's more is that only the, the warranties that are available for these systems for their parts and equipment are extended, but only are available for installations where um, a licensed professional was involved. So if you want to have a warranty, if you want to have a long lasting system, um, I, I, you know, and also, you know, comply with code and be able to take advantage of incentives. I highly recommend getting a professional involved and there's many of them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, other one is can ducted units only go with ducts and not a hot water system? I'm not sure if. Yeah, it, so they're they're ducted, um, and uh, yes, that's right. So I mean, like eventually, when we have, you know, when there is an air to water system, it will be plausible to set those up as as hydronic units that would be in coils and in duct work that way, if you wanted to, or to have it go through. You know, I mean, like if we we on the commercial side, we just Mitsubishi recently brought a very large, very expensive commercial water heater to the marketplace that uses carbon dioxide CO2 as the refrigerant, and it's able to hit 176 degrees and put out 130,000 BTUs, which is greater than most of the boilers out there, even you know that run brief periods of time during you know in a given hour, even during the peak hours of most houses. So you'd be like, wow. That would totally do everything that's needed for a house, but honestly, it's too big for houses. And so I'm hopeful that they'll bring a unit like that, that's maybe 36 or 40,000 BTUs to the United States. And that, I mean, like as soon as that lands, boy, now we can convert all the hydronics in the entire state over, um, won't that be a day? So, I, you know, that stuff is coming, but it's just not here yet. Okay, great, uh, a similar question. Can, uh, do heat pumps only heat air or can they heat water as in a forced hot water heating or radiant heating system? Yeah, so this this kind of falls back on the same thing. If you have baseboard heaters, you know, if you turn back your boiler to less than 150 degrees, you're just not gonna get enough heat because it it's the delta temperature, the difference in temperature between the, the radiant pipes and the air temperature in the room that drives the circulation of air into the room. And so if you had colder temperature water, like 110 or 120 circulating through standard baseboard, you really wouldn't get any heat at all beyond you know, a, a, you know, one foot of the, uh, the baseboard. It just doesn't operate that well that way. And that's why European panels are designed for lower temperature water. Um, that could be used with geothermal or low temp boilers, condensing boilers, um, or you see low temp available in ba uh, radiant. So radiant floor baseboard, yeah. And and you know, and I know that I just in the last breath was talking about the CO2 systems that operate up to 170 or something, and those those are coming, but they're you know we'll see uh, the applicability of those and the expense and et cetera. But the units that would be coming that use you know 410A for example their max temperature would be something approaching 135 or 140. Um, and so they would really only be applicable for domestic water heating um, and uh, true radiant in-floor or European panels. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Are there real world case studies on performance in New Hampshire and Maine? Uh, absolutely, um, you know, and, and in fact, um, they're, they're ongoing. Um, it's not 
it's not really that difficult to find any of those studies. All of the uh, all the uh, utilities or efficiency groups that run rebates, whether it's through Efficiency Maine or Efficiency Vermont or Massachusetts, they have to run evaluations on their programs every couple of years. And so, you know, I'm familiar with the Efficiency Maine website, uh, but I mean, if you go to efficiencymaine.com and you go to the library, you can go through and see the evaluations. And there are evaluations that go through and they they you know they talk to the users of these heat pumps, they look at the fuel savings, they uh, use, um, you know, they gauge all of the electric consumption and their effectiveness and draw, you know, statistical, uh, you know, studies on, on how they work and where they work. Um, the Department of Energy also has a number of uh, case studies that you can find that uh, show graphing on these different things um, across the region. And but you know even in in New Hampshire, one of the um, you know one of the consultants and experts uh, on heat pumps, Bruce Harley, he lives or you know had I believe he still has a house in and around Laconia. I mean like he's been studying the use of heat pumps uh, in northern New England for a very long time um, and documenting all that. And uh, so his information, you know, Bruce Harley is not too difficult to Google and find. Um, and, uh, you know, and he has different studies uh, that have been posted in different places and webinars, including, you know, NESI, the, the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association um, and others. But I mean, the, it, it, and the evaluations will continue. They, they're, on, they're ongoing. In fact, you know, Efficiency Maine's getting ready to kick off another one this year based on the work that's been done over the past two or three years. So, um, Yes, there are lots of case studies and, and you can find some even at our website at efficiency, I'm sorry, at uh, MitsubishiComfort.com. Thank you. Um, I have one that's asking about if you can do an entry into a double brick wall house, which I think would be uh, project dependent. An entry, like an entry into a double brick wall apart? I think that what they're asking is, is can you put a hole through the brick wall, which I think would be dependent on your site? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, you could definitely, I mean, like, even if it's a double brick wall, I mean, I, you know, if you can, if you can put penetrations on other, on either side and, and, uh, you know, and, and seal the brick up appropriately, it, it really, it won't be any different than any other circumstance. Okay. Um, this one is about are there yearly services required? And I think we can roll that into general servicing. Yeah, so uh, that's, that, that's a, I'm glad that was brought up. That's a good one. Uh, so, you know, generally speaking, the ductless units, meaning not duct work, um, they have little screens on them. And so periodically, probably once a month, um, especially during the peak of heating and cooling season, people should open up their indoor unit and pull out these little flimsy screens and and use you know either a sink sprayer or a shower sprayer to rinse off any of the dust and debris that's collected on these things that just really you know they're catching cat hair dog hair and you know and dust that's floating around in general but even though uh, you may clean those off with some frequency just to make sure you have good airflow um, it's also appropriate to have a professional come in and uh, and and basically power wash the indoor unit or dismantle it and um, uh, clean off the blower wheel. Um, probably, you know, at least every every couple of years. And it really depends. I mean, like if you have a house that has a high uh, load, you know, where it's like there's smokers or there's you know, lots of animals or it's a very dusty environment or something, you may need to have the indoor unit cleaned annually. Um, but it's also plausible that you would have somebody come after the first year and you look at it after they open it up and you realize, yeah, you know what, let's schedule it every other year or every third year. Um, and then the outdoor unit, you really just have to, you know, keep the coil clear of, uh, you know, grass clippings and spider webs and, and whatever other dirt and debris is floating around uh, your yard. Um, but um, that's that's primarily maintenance. If you have a situation where the system isn't operating properly or it's flashing at you, uh, you know, the indoor unit is not, you know, communicating properly or whatever, that's that's a point where you would call a technician to come and diagnose the situation. Thank you. This one is for Mark. Do the commercial buildings incentive include apartment buildings for Eversource? 
So typically apartment buildings would fall under our residential programs. The exception would be if you have significant common space that's on a house meter, that would typically get a commercial account. Uh, the, other, the other exception would be, um, and this is pretty rare, if you have a, a, an apartment building where the heat, where it's, it's entirely metered on one meter, um, rather than each unit having its own bill, and that that is assigned a commercial account. So for the commercial programs, you would need a commercial rated account. And for the resi programs, you'd need a residential rated account. Typically, they would get a residential meter though. Thank you. Um, this might be for either, but is there a general temperature at which the efficiency of heat pumps starts to drop off a low temperature? So at what temperature would it, would it be more efficient to fire up a pellet or wood stove to offset higher costs? Well, so the the um, you know when it's when it's like if I if I look up you know any one of the high performance models that's currently used in the state, um, you know if I look at at 47 degrees Fahrenheit, it might have a coefficient of performance approaching four, um, meaning for every one unit of of electricity I put in, I get four units of of uh, of heat delivered into the house and at, you know as you go down in lower and lower temperatures um, eventually you get down to probably a coefficient of performance of two meaning it's only 200 percent efficient <laughs> compare that to you know just about anything else it's going to be wildly more efficient um, and so when you get down to about 200 percent efficient at something like five degrees fahrenheit or you know even single digits or or uh teens well now you're pretty much at the equivalent of something like two dollar and sixty cent a gallon oil well i don't know who's priced out oil lately but that's pretty close to the price of oil right now and so you know the the cost saving they're really you know wood is cheaper than that right so there may be a point where you decide to use wood as a cost saving measure when you get down into the teens or something like that. And, and so I wouldn't necessarily turn off the heat pump though. What I would probably do is just keep the heat pump set at whatever you want as a comfortable temperature, you know, a 68 or 70 degrees, whatever your preference is, and then just use the wood stove. And so to whatever degree the wood stove contributes BTUs into the environment, um, the heat pump will back off and not operate as much. Um, and then when the fire burns down, you're not going to lose any temperature, but you'll just kind of be contributing to the overall, you know, comfort of the house. And it'll be more of a hobby instead of a, an occupation to, to stoke the wood stove. Thank you. In a commercial all-electric building, what is the advantage of a heat pump installation over photovoltaic solar? I think this could be for Dana or Mark. Well, so I, you know, Mark, Mark, just you know, I I can do this all day, so just uh, jump in anytime. Uh, but uh, um, the um, you know the the thing about solar that is so bloody magical is you can park these panels up on the rooftop and they generate electricity. I mean, like that is it, it's it's magic, you know. The and and what's more is that the price of panels have come down to the point where they're extremely competitive. Uh, with any uh, conventional uh, electricity sources. And so that's awesome. But, uh, you know, what are you doing with that electricity? Without, uh, you know, from a, from a cost-saving perspective, you know, a heat pump can, can be, you know, a priority relative to solar panels, depending on what your existing fuel source is for that building um, and what the ease of, of changing it over are. And so from a carbon footprint standpoint, if you were going to look at it that way, you know, the electricity in New Hampshire and, and across New England generally is already pretty darn clean. You know, I mean, like it's getting cleaner all the time. There's more and more renewables coming on board. But, you know, even if you just use a standard ISO New England electric um, and put that into a heat pump, it's going to be dramatically lower carbon than burning anything. So it depends on what your objectives are uh, between whether you would invest first in heat pumps or in um, solar panels. 
um, but uh, they're both part of the solution. Thank you. Um, I have one for Mark. Is there any additional information available on the energy optimization pilot program and eligibility? So currently that is part of, um, oh, sorry about that, that's, that's Daisy. Um, that is part of our 2021 proposed filing and we haven't we haven't quite got an agreement on that with the, the public utilities commission yet so we'll, we're hopefully going to have more information on that coming out soon once we get orders for the plan going forward okay thank you can a heat pump be used with a hydro air oil file fired system with central air and what is involved with converting that or using it at the oil system as a backup um, yeah, so I've, I've seen this uh, with, you know, so like if you had a forced air system and you wanted to pull out that forced air system that used to just be air conditioning, you could put in one of our air handlers and tie it into your existing ductwork. And then our air handlers and a lot of our other indoor units have um, a connector on them that uh, will signal if a second stage is required in order to maintain set point. So if the heat pump is unable to keep up for whatever reason with the heating load demand of the building, um, it can throw out a, a, a signal that can close a, a low voltage relay that would serve just like a thermostat would to trigger on a hydronic zone that would be embedded into the ductwork and operate alongside with the heat pump um, and serve as that second stage. Um, and there are there are even um, hydronic uh, adapters that uh, have a coil in them that would fit right on our air handlers directly um, that are available through through a third market. And I, it also the, that exactly that same scenario that I've just painted is applicable to other manufacturers as well. Thank you. Um, a similar question: If someone has a oil furnace that needs to be replaced with forced hot water. There's no gas line of the street and no duct work. So what kind of green replacement should they consider? Well, you know, I think this is, I, I actually have a, a good friend that's facing this right now with, with a house that they're moving into. And, you know, it really, it's, um, you know, it's one of these things where you look at it and you're like, man, I already have the distribution system for the, the hydronic in place. All I'd have to do is replace this boiler and put in a new, oil fired boiler and I've already got the rest of the infrastructure in place and so it might be cheaper to do that you know seven eight nine ten thousand dollars or something to do that and if I don't replace the oil boiler and I walk down this path of heat pumps if I want to get the same level of distribution throughout the entire house it's probably going to be more than that in order to accomplish that with heat pumps sorry about that um, you know, and, and so how, you know, how do I, how do you weigh the pluses and minuses of that? And, um, and, and what's more is you're going to have all this baseboard that, you know, is not going to be used or you're going to have to remove it. So, um, I can understand how that would be, you know, something that would weigh heavy. Um, but really, you know, you're deciding what you're heating, what you're going to heat your home with for a very long time. You know, boilers last for like 15 years. So you're tying yourself or 20, you know, or longer. So you really, when you choose to replace an oil boiler and put in a new oil boiler, you're choosing to do that for decades. And if you look at the cost savings over that period of time, and you think about it either from the perspective of, you know, financing or, um, you know, a, uh, you know, a home equity line or something along those lines, you're going to, you it, it's not too difficult to really justify switching over to heat pumps. Plus you're going to get air conditioning. So, you know, of course I, I'm, I'm strongly biased in this direction, but I recognize that that's, that's one of those difficult moments when you make that choice. Thank you. Um, a similar question that you we're just going over about life expectancy. Uh, what is the life expectancy and what are maintenance costs on residential units? Yeah, so typically the industry standard is to expect heat pumps to last for something like 15 years. Um, you know, that, that really, um, you know, some amount of maintenance and having them checked on periodically is part of that. Um, and having a technician come out to your 
location and look over the entire system and make sure the indoor and outdoor units are all you know cleaned and operating within specifications you know there's there's no real special magic tools to it it's really not any different than having a technician come out um, and look at your conventional heating system and so the the costs are are similar you know it might uh, depends on the contractor um, and exactly what they're doing for the system but it might be you know, a hundred bucks to three hundred bucks. Uh, you know, it, if you had a really extensive system, it might be more to have them do a thorough cleaning of all the indoor units. Um, and so, it's in that sort of it's sort of consistent with conventional uh, system services. Thank you. Uh, if someone has three adjacent interior rooms, is there a way to use just one single indoor unit? So uh, you you know you can certainly uh, duct though you could duct a, a single you know air handler uh, to hit those three rooms and even have your return duct out of the hallway if you didn't want to have return ducts in each one of the rooms that's that's definitely one way of managing three rooms um, you know depending on you know the the usage like the doors the position of them um, you know and and how tight the exterior um, envelope of the house is um, and what your expectations are for temperature throughout those spaces, it might be plausible to position ahead either in one of those rooms or in the hallway, have like a ceiling cassette that points in three directions if the doors were going to be open. I, I mean, like in my own experience, I live in a relatively small house with my family and it's an old style cape, uh, you know, like I think the thing was originally built in 1820s. We've since updated the weatherization quite a bit. Um, and, and I lowered my heating usage uh, of K1 when I had monitor heaters pretty dramatically um, to the point where I was really only using about 250 gallons per year of, of kerosene. And that's when I ripped the, the monitor heater out and put in a, a rather small single zone system just in the entryway as you come in the front door. There's no heat on the second floor. Um, and there's two small bedrooms up there, you know, with slope ceilings, as you'd expect in a tiny little cape. And um, my kids, they don't use winter blankets. Um, the heat rises, it's fine. They don't get a whole lot of cooling, but, you know, how long do you want your kids to live at home anyways? Um, so, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, so, you know, it really depends on what your expectations are um, you, as to as to how you want to accomplish it. But um, you know, whether you need units in each room or just one um, is something that really is a is a personal choice as to as to what the and and also somewhat depends on the structure of the house. It's in, one strategy for approaching that would simply to be like I'm going to put in one unit and I'm going to see how it goes, and if then uh, I'll decide whether I need to add another one later. There's really no economic uh, discount or, or uh, uh, economic penalty uh, for for slowly walking into uh, heat pumps as instead of leaping in with both feet. Okay, we're coming up on the end of our time here. We can go a little bit over. Um, I'm just going to move to our last. Yeah, end the slide. Uh, yeah, that's the last one we had. Um, so our last two questions um one is from wes uh they have a deep energy retrofit already with added solar the final thing they want to do is replace their oil system with uh pellets for backup would they be eligible for any utility benefits without a current retrofit yes thank thanks for the question we don't offer incentives on pellet systems for residential customers so i don't think that would apply to to our programs um, and typically to, to answer a little more broadly if we're doing a, a residential replacement it's always either through that mail-in program that i mentioned or as a a whole house retrofit thank you let's see do heat pump efficiencies degrade over time? 
Uh, as long as the systems are kept clean, like, you know, the, the, the primary reason that they would degrade would be just because the coil is getting clogged and it's, it needs to, you know, it needs to be cleaned out. Uh, that's a primary loss of efficiency. If, you know, the system is installed properly, there shouldn't be any degrade in uh, the, the capacity of the system over time. Um, you know, I, I, earlier there was a question about um, a maintenance garage or, or installing a system in a maintenance garage, and I, I think uh, James just emailed me um, and asked a, kind of a little bit of a follow-up to that uh, related to concerns about dust. And so, you know, if if you're going to be installing a heat pump in an environment where there's going to be a lot of dust or sawdust or, you know, dirt and debris or whatever else like that, then you know an elevated cleaning cycle may be appropriate, um, or it may be appropriate to install a ducted system where you could have a filter, right? Because if you have like a conventional furnace filter leading in to your your air your your heat pump, you'd be able to you know put in whatever kind of filter would be required in order to remove dust from the air, which is not only better for the heat pump but it's also better for all the people uh, and stuff in the environment. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming to our webinar. Uh, you can find more webinars and information at www.nhenergy.org or information at our website, at Clean Energy New Hampshire. I'd like to thank our presenters, Mark and Dana, for attending. And uh, looking forward to having more webinars and I encourage anyone that enjoyed this to sign up for our newsletter and potentially become a member of Clean Energy New Hampshire. Thank you and have a great day.